our great God together this morning. Why don't we take a moment to greet each other with warm smile, saying, you're the reason why Sundays are extra sunny. <laughs> you're the reason why Sundays are extra <laughs> sunny. And what a joy it is to dive deep into God's Word together. Uh, two Sundays ago, we began our journey through the book of Ruth. And today we find ourselves in Ruth chapter 2. And I would like for you to open your Bible with me to this beautiful chapter, chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It's in the Old Testament after Judges. Ruth chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. And I titled this sermon as The Harvesting Hope When Life Feels Empty. Have you ever hit rock bottom? Not just where life gets tough, but where everything around you seems stripped away with nothing left to hold on to. Sometimes life can leave us feeling like a well that's run dry. You've been drawing and drawing, pouring yourself out, but now the well has gone completely dry. You dip your bucket down one more time, hoping, praying that something is left, but you pull up nothing but dust. That's the place Naomi and Ruth found themselves in at the beginning of chapter 2. Think about Naomi's life life's journey. She started out with her heart full, her future secure, surrounded by a husband and sons. But little by little, life tragedy stripped everything away. Her husband was gone. Her sons lost. And now she's left with nothing but grief in the land of Moab. And now in the midst of her emptiness, she's left with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, a Moabite, an outsider, a young woman with a different background and culture. Naomi never wanted Ruth to come with her back to Israel. Imagine the weight of guilt Naomi carried going back to Bethlehem after all these years. The last thing she wanted was one more person to take care of, especially Ruth. Ruth was a reminder of the years she spent in the foreign land of Moab, outside the promised land. She was a reminder of her sons marrying Moabite woman of the compromises and choices that she couldn't undo. Naomi had done everything to discourage Ruth from coming. She said in so many words, go back with Orpah. Let me be alone with my guilt and my bitterness against the Lord. She believed this was all the Lord's doing. That God had afflicted her, brought misfortune on her. Ruth, I want you to go back to your own home, to your own God. Ruth, why would you want to go with me? Why would you want to tie your life to a person like me, a broken woman whose life has fallen apart? Why would you want to follow my God, a God who has made my life so bitter? Like Naomi, when we are facing the darkest moments, it's sometimes hard to see past our pain. And so this unlikely pair, this grieving Jewish widow and her Moabite daughter-in-law took the road back to Bethlehem, facing what looked like an uncertain future. They had nothing to rely on but the charity of family and what little food they could scrape together. But at the very end of chapter 1, we find a hint of hope, a glimmer of God's timing. So would you please look at chapter 1, verse 22 in your Bible. It says, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as what was beginning? The barley harvest was beginning. It says they arrive in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. It's such a small detail, but it's the narrator's way of saying, hold on, there's more to come. Even as Naomi is only focused on what she's lost, God was quietly beginning a season of provision. You see, Naomi couldn't see clearly through her tears. 
Her heart was filled with grief, with regret, and she could only see her life as a movement from, em- from fullness to emptiness. But while Naomi felt her world had gone from full to empty, her people, the Israelites, had actually gone from famine to fullness. God's provision was already at work in the promised land once again. It's like he was saying, Naomi, if I can bring Bethlehem from famine to harvest, don't you believe I can bring your life from empty to full again? The truth was that God's favor was quietly unfolding in ways she couldn't yet see. In the meantime, Ruth and Naomi faced a pressing issue. How would they survive? They had nothing to eat. But Ruth was the possible solution to the problem. Please look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 in your Bible with me. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. Ruth's suggestion here wasn't just about finding food. It was a step of faith. According to the law of Moses, landowners were commanded to leave the edges of their fields unharvested. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9 to 10, God said, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and foreigner. I am the Lord your God. This practice allowed the poor, the widow, and the foreigner to glean to gather any leftover grain so they could find the way to feed themselves. So even in the Old Testament, we see the fingerprints of God's compassionate love and grace everywhere. But gleaning wasn't an easy task. It was hard, exhausting, hot work. Imagine spending the day bending low under the sun, picking up scraps, barely enough to live on. And it was dangerous, especially for someone like Ruth, a Moabite woman, a foreigner with no one to protect her. Ruth was taking an extreme risk, stepping out with no guarantee of safety, trusting that there would be a generous God-fearing landowner who would follow God's commandments and allow her to glean. Likewise, when we are in need, we are often called to move forward in faith, not knowing how things will turn out, isn't it? You see, faith doesn't sit around waiting for provision to magically fall into our laps, but it moves. So we are called to keep moving forward, doing whatever we can do, And as we do, we trust that God will provide for our needs. Will you say amen? Amen. But here's a question that often comes up to me when I look at this story. Why didn't Naomi go out with Ruth? She wasn't physically disabled as far as we know, and she was likely only in her late 50s. It would have been safer and they could have gathered more grain. But Naomi chose not to go. Perhaps Naomi's heart was so weighed down with bitterness, so overcome with grief and guilt, that she simply couldn't bring herself up to get up and go. Naomi's life had fallen apart. And that kind of grief can lead to despair, a feeling of being unable to move, like we're stuck in place. Just look at her response to Ruth's offering in verse 2. Go, my daughter. Seems so short almost lifeless as she, if she didn't have the energy to care anymore. Have you ever been in that place? Where worry and despair feel like chains around your heart, holding you back from even trying to move forward. When we lose sight of God's goodness, when we start to doubt his promises, it's all too easy to sink into inactivity. We tell ourselves, what's the point? Nothing's going to change And we do nothing, and our situation only grows worse. It's downward spiral, isn't it? Inactivity deepens our despair, and despair keeps us inactive. It's a cycle that feels impossible to break. 
But the key to breaking the cycle is found in God's faithfulness. It's found in remembering his commitment to do us good. Ruth's action reminds us of the faith we are called to have. A faith that doesn't know the outcome, but trusts the one who holds the future. We may not know what the future holds, but we know that the one who holds the future loves us deeply. Amen? When we doubt his love, we need only to look at the cross. When you feel the weight of grief and despair, we can look to God's faithfulness. The love, the supreme love he has shown through Christ, trust that he will carry us through, even when we don't know what tomorrow holds. Well, as it turned out, there was indeed someone in Bethlehem who cared for the poor and honored God, a man named Boaz. Boaz was a distant relative of Naomi's husband, verse 1 says, man of integrity and generosity and a respected member of the community. And as luck would have it, Ruth, not knowing whose field was who was whose, ended up gathering grain in Boaz's field. Would you please look at verse 3 in your Bible with me? So she went out, entered the field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, it says, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. But the narrator of Ruth doesn't want to use us to see this as a mere luck or coincidence. This was no random turn of events. This was God's hand guiding her steps. Even though there were no visions or voices from heaven, God was quietly leading Ruth to the exact place where she needed to be, into the arms of a God-fearing man who would care for her. And in a matter of time, Boaz himself arrived at the field to check on the harvest. And his very first words to his workers were, the Lord be with you. And what an introduction to his character, right? And his workers replied in kind, the Lord bless you. Boaz wasn't just their boss. He was someone who honored God and treated his people with dignity. And as Boaz looked over the field, he noticed a new face, Ruth, a foreign woman gleaning among the poor. Now his question is interesting in verse 5. He doesn't ask, who is she? Like he just wanted a name. But he asks, how does, what does that woman, who does that young woman belong to? A question about belonging and place. Boaz wants to understand where Ruth fits in, who her people are. Then the servant explained in the next verses, she is the Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from Moab. She asked to glean, and she's been working steadily from morning until now. And Boaz knew of Ruth. Word had already traveled about the foreign woman who left everything behind to care for her mother-in-law. Boaz must have been impressed, knowing that Ruth didn't just come to Israel for a fresh start, but out of loyalty and love for Naomi. Here was a woman with no connections, no status, but only a fierce dedication to the family she had joined. And in spite of the huge gap in between their social standings, Boaz speaks to her as a person with respect, calling her my daughter, and gives her protection. Would you please look at verses 8 to 12 with me? So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the woman who worked for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the woman. I've told the man not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, Ruth bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes? Did you notice me? I'm a foreigner. Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. Verse 12, may the Lord repay you what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth was overwhelmed by Boaz's kindness 
she falls on her face and says, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me? I'm just a foreigner. And think about what these words meant to her. Ruth, who had only known herself as an outsider, who had every reason to be fearful and alone, was being given favor. Boaz saw Ruth's heart and recognized her faith. He knew that she had come to take refuge under God's wings, and he honored that. And he didn't just speak kind words either. He acted on them. The next verses tell us that when it was time to eat, he invited Ruth to join him and his workers. This wasn't the norm. Gleaners didn't share the meals of the workers, especially not foreigners like Ruth. But Boaz wanted her to know she was welcome. He even passed her roasted grain himself, making sure she had plenty, enough to satisfy her hunger and to have some left over. Imagine the joy Ruth must have felt, having enough to eat for the first time in days, maybe for weeks. But above all, she likely felt the warmth of someone's kindness. She was full not only because she was filled with food, but because she had received the compassion of another's love. Then Boaz went even further. He instructed his men to leave extra grain behind on purpose for Ruth to gather. Please look at verses 15 to 17 with me. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. Boaz was going out of his way to make sure Ruth was abundantly provided for. When she finally went home to Naomi that evening, she brought back an ephah of barley, it says. It's about 30 to 50 pounds, enough food to last for weeks. Imagine the look on Naomi's face as Ruth dragged in the huge bag of grain. Here was a man who didn't just look at Ruth as a foreigner, a Moabite widow with no place or standing. Boaz saw her heart and honored her commitment, inviting her into the family, treating her with the same dignity and worth as any other Israelite. And this is the question for us this morning. Do we welcome the outsiders among us the way Boaz welcomed Ruth? Do we look past the surface, past where people come from, what they look like, and truly see their heart? Too often we only want to connect with people who fit our mold, people who look like us or shape our background. But God calls us to go further, to reach out to those who might not fit in, to extend a hand and make them feel welcome just as Boaz did. So whom do you see in your own field? Who are the people in, in your life that you might overlook? Maybe it's someone in our church who sits alone, someone in our community who's going through their time of grief, or who doesn't look or speak like everyone else. Are we willing to go out of our way as Boaz did to make them feel seen and valued. God's heart has always been for the outcast and the stranger, as we saw in the, in the law of Leviticus. And just as he guided Ruth to Boaz field, he may have guided some of these people to cross our paths so that we might be his hands and feet to them. When Ruth came that evening, she didn't just bring back food. She brought back a story. And for the first time in a long time, hope sparked in Naomi's heart. For so long, Naomi believed that God had turned his back on her, that made her life bitter, that she changed her name to Mara, bitterness. But notice how Naomi's heart begins so to soften in verse 20. She said, He, God, has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. This is significant because for the first time, Naomi acknowledges that God's kindness, his hesed, 
his covenant faithfulness hadn't left her. She was beginning to see that the Lord wasn't out to punish her, but instead had gone ahead of her, preparing blessing even through Ruth's work. Also, as I was contemplating the message, I noticed something very special in Naomi's words. And God has shown kindness to the living and the dead. So there's something I didn't notice. In English, the word living doesn't specify if it is a singular or plural, right? But Hebrew language has a unique way of making this clear. And I opened my Hebrew Bible and I saw that the word living is plural. Which means that Naomi wasn't only thinking of herself anymore. She was thinking of herself and Ruth. When they first returned to Bethlehem, Ruth was almost invisible to the townspeople. And Naomi only saw Ruth as a painful reminder of her past. But now, Naomi is beginning to see Ruth as an integral part of God's covenant blessing. And if you carefully see verse 20 again, Naomi adds, That man, Boaz, is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Why would she call her family member a redeemer? I understand Boaz is Naomi's distant relative, but why does she call him a redeemer? Because ever since back then, there was in the law of Moses this concept called the kinsman redeemer in Israel. In ancient Israel, a kinsman redeemer was a close relative who would step in to help a family member in dire need. Basically, the kinsman redeemer had three main responsibilities. First, if someone had lost everything and fell into debt and even had to sell themselves as a slave, then a close relative would step up and act as a redeemer to buy back his relatives to rescue them from their slavery. Then secondly, similarly, if a family member had lost everything and forced to sell their own property and land to survive, the kinsman redeemer would step up and buy the land back, restoring the relative's family inheritance to continue in the land of, promised land of Israel. But the important one is the third one. Thirdly, if a man died without an heir, the kinsman redeemer could marry the widow, ensuring the family line would continue in God's line. So this wasn't a duty that anyone could take lightly. It requires extreme sacrifice, generosity, and love. And here's the incredible part. Boaz didn't have to even fulfill this role for Ruth. He wasn't even the closest relative. And according to the law, he wasn't obligated to step in. In fact, there were a lot of legal loopholes that Boaz could have used to avoid any responsibility for Ruth and Naomi. No one would like to do that. And think about that. Ruth was a foreigner. A Moabite who had married into the family under unusual circumstances, which gave Boaz every reason to step back. But Boaz's heart had been shaped by God's covenant faithfulness. His chesed, this mysterious and beautiful Hebrew word in verse 20. God's steadfast kindness, love, and loyalty that goes beyond what's expected. Boaz saw Ruth's need and Naomi's brokenness, and he was moved not by duty, but by a love that mirrors God's love for his people. He embodied, has said, God's covenant faithfulness, not because he was legally bound, but because his heart was bound to God's compassion. And there's even a hint of repentance in Naomi's words to Ruth. Please look at verse 22. In verse 22, she said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the woman who worked for him because in someone else's field you might be harmed. She told Ruth, stay in Boaz's field. Don't go anywhere. It is as if Naomi was urging Ruth to avoid the mistake she herself made in Moab. Years before, Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, had left Bethlehem. God's land of promise in search of greener pastures, and they ended up facing loss and hardship. Now Naomi is saying, stay where God's blessing is. Don't wonder as I did. Don't go looking for satisfaction outside of his provision. Stay in his field. And the story of Boaz and Ruth calls us to reflect on our own, our own lives. 
Are we like Naomi, willing to trust that God's provision is enough right now? Are we willing to recognize his hesed, his covenant faithfulness, his loyal kindness and love, even when we cannot yet see how it will unfold? And this morning, Boaz's kindness shows us the kind of God's love towards us. It's not about fulfilling requirements. It's not about checking off duties that he came. But it's about love that moves us to go beyond obligation, to care for others, and to reflect the compassionate love of God. We serve a God who chooses to love us not because he must. He came down because he desires to, with a love that never lets go, a love that covers us, and the love that invites us to find refuge under his wings. In this beautiful story of the book of Ruth, there's a clock ticking. It's easy to miss because we are not always listening for it. But, we are, we, but as we tune our ears to the rhythm of redemptive history, it becomes strikingly clear. Because if we go back and glance at chapter 1, verse 22 again, Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem at the beginning of what? Beginning of the barley harvest. That's right around the time of Passover when the grain harvest began. As you know, the Passover is a time of remembrance when God's people celebrated their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. And the timing here could not be more perfect. Ruth and Naomi's return from Moab to Bethlehem was their own kind of exodus, wasn't it? Leaving behind barrenness, leaving behind emptiness and grief in Moab for a chance at a new beginning in the land of promise. Passover was the start of the Jewish year. Passover was a season ripe for the barley harvest, a fresh start, a chance for God's grace to bring them out of their darkness. Then come back and look at the end of, verse, end of chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 23. So Ruth stayed close to the woman of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. By the end of chapter 2, we read that the barley harvest was coming to a close. Starting with the Passover, 50 days of harvest has passed, and we are approaching Pentecost. Pentecost was the next great festival in Israel after the Passover, a time when the people brought the first portion of their 50 days of harvest to God as a sign of gratitude and trust for his provision. For Naomi and Ruth, these seven weeks, these 50 days in Boaz field were full of the first fruits of God's provision. Day after day, Ruth and Naomi would see God's kindness in the grain that's been gleaned. His care in the abundance Boaz allowed, and his faithfulness in providing for their every need. But here's what's truly remarkable. Ruth wasn't only receiving the first fruits of God's grace, but Ruth herself was the first fruits of God's grace in a much greater redemptive history. Because of over a thousand years after Ruth, during the time of Jesus, we find ourselves back at the festival of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Remember? This time it's not just crops that were being offered by the pilgrims. But what happened in the middle of that? The Holy Spirit came down upon all believers. Pentecost, the time of the full harvest, becomes the day God pours out his spirit on both Jews and Gentiles alike bringing them together as one people in Christ. You see, Ruth's beautiful story, her willingness to follow Naomi, and her incorporation by faith into the people of Israel foreshadows this day when God's grace would extend to all nations. Ruth, a poor foreigner from Moab, becomes part of the family of God. She's a picture of what's to come a living symbol of the true harvest that God would one day gather from every tribe and language when his spirit was poured out on all nations. Ruth and Naomi may not have realized it, but their lives were ticking along the heartbeat of God's redemptive clock. Although they never saw the full picture in their journey of hardship and pain, they were part of a much bigger story. 
a story that will one day invite all people, all of us as Gentiles, in the place, in the family of God. And beloved, there's a clock ticking for us too. Our journey is much like Ruth and Naomi's. There are moments we cannot fully understand, struggles that weigh heavily, and pains that feel too deep to bear. Yet even in these places of darkness and waiting, God is writing a bigger story. Do you believe that? Just as he worked through Ruth's faithfulness and Naomi's resilience to bring about a redemption that echoed down through the generations, he is working in our lives, weaving each thread of sorrows and joys into his grand design of grace. Please remember that right in this very moment, God's spirit is with us in our pain, in our waiting, in our longings. The Holy Spirit who poured out at Pentecost is the same spirit comforting us today, reminding us that we are not alone. Every hardship, every tear, every moment of uncertainty is known by him. And although we may not see the full picture now, we can trust that we are being drawn into his eternal story, a story of redemption, healing, and ultimate joy. So beloved, take heart this morning. Hold on to hope. The same God who transformed Ruth and Naomi's pain into purpose is at work in your life too. One day we'll see the fullness of of what he's doing. One day our stories will be fully redeemed and we'll stand in the light of his glory, rejoicing in the harvest beyond anything we can imagine. So until then, let us walk by faith, not by sight. Assured that God's love never fails and his promises are sure. I love you all and bless you all in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And let all God's people say, Amen. 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 Let's pray together. God has given us another precious message to us this morning. His living word is powerful enough to heal the broken hearts. And this message is for, we can all relate to them because we have been there. But we want to understand that while we may not see it, God has already been preparing the harvest for them. There was harvest of hope for them as they walked in the dusty road back to Bethlehem. Although we may not see, although we may be stuck in our grief and hardship, God is writing a bigger story for you. Who would have imagined that Ruth would become the Gentile woman coming into the faith and into the family of God and she'll one day be the shadow, the picture for all of us, all of us, the Gentiles who are sitting here this morning, that God is inviting all of us to become part of his family. What a beautiful picture Ruth is showing us this morning. That as we, the Gentiles, place our faith in Jesus Christ, we can be like Ruth, incorporated into the family of God. Although they may not realize it at that point, they probably didn't see the full picture in their lifetime. God was writing a bigger story for them. And so does he. He's writing a bigger story for you right now. To trust in him, lean on him, depend on him, gain strength from him. So let's pray together this morning that God help me to see beyond my pain, beyond my grief, beyond my hardship. To see your majesty, grace, and love working for me on my behalf, that you are writing a bigger story for me, a wonderful story of redemption. So let's pray together this morning. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your living word this morning. We pray for our broken souls, our broken heart, whatever the past that has brought hardship on us. Lord, We believe and we trust this morning that you are God 
who is already always there for us. You are already at work preparing the harvest for us, Lord. Lord, help us to see beyond our emptiness, beyond our grief, that you are preparing the harvest for us. That you are already at work, Lord. Lord, help us to see the roots in our community, in our own field, that we may extend the same grace and compassion and love as Boaz did. Lord, help us. Help us and lead us. Oh, Father God, we thank you for your living word. Your living word is so precious and sweeter than honey. It's powerful to heal the broken hearts, Lord. We pray that we would that you would open the spiritual eyes of our hearts, that we may see the roots in our own field today, who may be discouraged, who may be in their grief, that we may extend our hands of compassion and love to them, Lord. May we show the compassionate love like Boaz did, because we have received the same love from you, Lord. Lord, Also for those who are broken, those who are in pain and grief, Lord, help us to see beyond our pain, to see the greater story that you're writing in our own lives, Lord, that you're already at work, even though our lives sometimes feel it's empty, but you're preparing the harvest for us even before we arrive. You're already at work in our lives. So help us to trust, give you the full trust in you this morning, Lord. Whatever the family issues or sickness that we're going through, may we trust you with our wholehearted heart, knowing that you are already at work, preparing the harvest in our lives, Lord. We thank you and we love you. We pray for all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.